our next conversation um, is called Restore the Second Chance Economy. This is, um, I, f I feel like this is so much in keeping with a, a lot of, uh, of what Secretary Clinton said earlier and even what um, Governor Patrick said, that just this idea that there should, um, there should, there should be a way in America, uh, in, in our economy, for people to have a second chance, that the long unemployed should be able to come back into the workforce, that people who've been incarcerated should be able to get jobs after they come out. And, and, and so I, I find this a particularly appealing conversation. Reed Kramer, um, the director of our asset building program, um, is, is one of the co-authors of this. Um, before he was with us, he was at the Office of Management and Budget. And somewhere out in the audience is his predecessor, the founder of the asset building program at New America. Um, and uh, uh, Ray Boshara, so if he's here, I hope he'll come up to the front, where it's freezing cold, by the way, and now I know why no one is sitting up here. Um, we're also joined by uh, Monica Potts, a fellow um, in the Asset Building Program, senior writer for the American Prospect. Uh, Nicole Austin Hillary, director and counsel of the Brennan Center for Justice in DC, and Bernard Carrick, the retired former uh, police commissioner of New York. So um, this should be a fun conversation. I'll let Reed do more formal introductions, but thanks very much. That was pretty good. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you can get our names up there and uh, we'll get underway here. Uh, I'm pleased to lead this discussion on uh, restoring a second chance uh, economy. And uh, with my colleagues, uh, Rachel Black and Alita Sprague, uh, we open our big ideas essay uh, that's in your programs by stating that uh, the, the promise of a second chance is really a, a signature refrain of the American uh, narrative. Um, I mean, it really accompanies this um, claim that life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness are fundamental rights of citizenship and not just mere products of uh, circumstance. And, and it's that opportunity uh, that really kind of motivates the aspirational climb up the economic ladder. Uh, it explains some of the entrepreneurial spirit uh, of America that's led to so much um, prosperity. And I think while we want to argue that there are no guarantees that uh, risk will lead to reward, we certainly want to make sure that, that, that failure, when it does occur, is, is only a temporary setback and um, it, it doesn't become a permanent and a fixed uh, condition. So I think that's really foundational for delivering on this promise of a, of a second chance. And it shouldn't matter where you start out, uh, but you shouldn't be locked in. And uh, here I think I sound like Secretary uh, uh, Clinton uh, from, the, from this morning, but really the key is that uh, people need to be enabled to, to overcome past failures uh, with effort and with uh, ability. And yet we have uh, a situation where really millions of, of our uh, fellow uh, Americans face really large and often institutional barriers uh, when they're striving to rebuild their lives after hardship. Um, th this includes a number of different types of, of, of people uh, that I think we're thinking about. Uh, it includes groups like uh, the long-term unemployed right now, who uh, in many ways are being uh, left behind in the, the economy. They can't get uh, jobs. Uh, they're losing their skills. Uh, they need a second chance. It also includes families that have experienced some financial turmoil. Uh, we've had the Great Recession. We've seen havoc wrecked on the family balance sheet. Uh, families have lost homes. They're in debt. Uh, we have a young cohort of Americans uh, carrying on a lot of student uh, debt. They need a second chance. And it also includes those that have experience with uh, the criminal justice system. Um, since 1980, we've seen our rates of incarceration quadruple. A new study by the National Research Council is out verifying these rates. This is among the, the largest rates uh, in the world. Um, and then each year, we have about 100 and uh, 650,000 Americans that uh, return to society. But ex-offenders routinely find it hard uh, to get jobs, they're denied work, and they're really prevented in some, some meaningful ways from re-entering um, their communities. So for all these groups, uh, we argue that uh, reclaiming the mantle of the second chance society will require a new public ethos where um, resiliency is encouraged uh, in the face of, of adversity. And I think we need to look for public policies that can be uh, used to advance social inclusion, economic inclusion, uh, and also root out institutional barriers that, that end up doubling down on, on disadvantage in, in unfair uh, ways. So that's the conversation we're, we're looking to um, have here. Uh, I think we also need to think in meaningful ways about how our, our policies disproportionately impact communities of color. Um, and that's a, a, a broad uh, 
uh, issue here that I think we can, we can weave into this uh, discussion. So we want to advance this conversation about restoring a second chance uh, today, specifically for those who have come through the criminal justice system. So um, I'm joined here by Nicole Austin Hillary, Monica Potts, Bernard Carrick. Um, they all are going to um, offer their perspective. Um, yeah, just to say a few, uh, emphasize what, what Rachel said in her introductions. Uh, Nicole is director and counsel of the Washington, D.C. office of the Brennan Center for Justice. They're based out of NYU, but six years ago she opened the D.C. office uh, here and is advancing their work on criminal justice, uh, voting rights, a number of things. So we're pleased to have you here. Uh, Monica Potts is an award-winning journalist at the American Prospect. She's also a fellow with New America. We've been pleased to have her in our midst. She writes extensively about uh, families in poverty. She writes very humanely uh, about these uh, families. And her recent cover story, the current cover story in The Prospect, is on uh, featuring two men in Baltimore who are really striving to put their lives uh, back together after uh, spending time in, uh, in prison. And uh, Bernard Carrick, uh, former police commissioner and correction commissioner of uh, New York City. And in this capacity, these are two of the largest um, law enforcement organizations in the world. Uh, in 2004, he was nominated to head the Department of Homeland Security. He eventually withdrew his nomination from consideration, and then he experienced the criminal justice system from the other side. And uh, as an as a ex-offender who has lived within the federal justice system, uh, the prison system, uh, he now argues that that system is in dire need of, of repair. So really, thanks for, for joining us. Um, and let me start with, with Nicole. Um, you know, life after prison. Let, let's kind of start with, with zeroing in on, on some of the, the obstacles. And how would you describe what some of the more debilitating uh, impacts and, and collateral consequences are uh, of our current approach to criminal justice? Sure. Thank you, Reed. First of all, thank you for having me on the panel today. This is such an important discussion. You know, the, the, the interesting thing about when one has to re-enter society after being an incarcerated individual is that every basic thing that most of us take for granted really becomes a barrier um, from how you get your home, where you live, to where you work, to whether you can take advantage of educational opportunities, um, to whether you can become a full-fledged member of our democracy by exercising your right to vote. All of these things become very difficult for you to become engaged in. And it really goes against the grain of who we are as a society. You know, we say at the Brennan Center, uh, when it comes to our democracy, the foundation of our democracy is really that it is about providing opportunity and creating equal opportunity for all. But that's really not what manifests itself when it comes to how we as a country treat the formerly incarcerated. In fact, uh, we do ask people to pay their debts to society, but then once they do, do, we make it extremely difficult for them to become full-fledged members of our communities. And that has a trickle-down effect. Not only does that make it difficult for that person to re-engage, it also impacts their families, it impacts their children, from doing anything such as finding a, a safe home and neighborhood for your child, to showing your child what it means to be active in your community and to be actively engaged in your democracy by doing something like exercising your right to vote. So that's really what the overarching issue is, that we simply make it difficult for you to become a full-fledged member of society, even though what we say and what we communicate in this country is you commit a crime, you pay your debt, and then you're supposed to be put back at square one. You're supposed to be on an equal playing field with everyone else. But that's not actually what happens in terms of our policies and what opportunities we, we, pr we provide for the formerly incarcerated. Yeah, um, thanks. And, and, and Monica, let, let's, let's turn to you and your, your cover story. Um, t tell us a little bit about the, uh, the, the, these guys. And, and um, you or your editors called it survivors of the drug wars. Um, Tell us a little bit about the obstacles that they've faced and, and kind of the effort they're putting forth to get their lives back together. Sure. Um, I concentrated for the story on um, Travis Jones, who's 32, who um, had been a drug dealer for most of his adult life and finally ended up serving three and a half years of a five-year sentence in a federal or a state prison in Maryland. Um, and um, he he returned in 2007 and he really struggled to do very basic things least of which was just getting a driver's license again it took him about a year to do that and without those things you can't get a job and you can't necessarily you can't drive and you can't take classes because you can't get anywhere especially in a city like Baltimore where public transportation isn't the best especially in areas like West Baltimore that are very poor um, so he moved back into the basement of his girlfriend's house um, he had maintained that relationship and 
he didn't work for the better part of five years. He had very small jobs that didn't necessarily pay very well. Um, he lost them. Um, he didn't really adjust very well to being back in jobs. And he didn't really adjust very well to being back in society. He didn't want to make friends. He didn't want to trust other people because anyone who had, um, anyone who could possibly get in the trouble with the law could get him into even more trouble. So he really withdrew into the basement and turned it into a second kind of prison. Um, and it really took him five years to think about what he could do to get um, his life back on track and he decided to take part in a job training program and so he spent nine to five for four weeks without getting paid in a job training program and really worked very very hard at it because that's how much he wanted to work in the legal world he didn't want to go back to dealing drugs even though that would have been easy and it's what he knew and he could have made good money um, and he had made good money doing it and so he um, you know he really volunteered his time to make himself more employable, and then at the end of it, there still there just weren't jobs sitting around for him. So he's still struggling. He he's I've I've kept in touch with him since the story was published, and he's applied for a number of jobs. And he gets to the interview session, and they tell him his record is a problem for them. Um, and so whatever considerations he's supposed to be given, he's just not feeling that he gets that, and he he goes through serious serious depression, pretty serious depression, I think, because of it. Um, thanks, and, and uh, Bernie, your, your story is, I'd say, far from typical, uh, but uh, you really do have a new appreciation for some of the challenges of re-entry, and uh, a lot of people who are incarcerated, they, they don't enter with, they, they come back without any financial resources or professional network. Um, you know, what's your sense of some of the barriers that uh, are out there for the people trying to re-enter? I, I want to touch on one thing Nicole said, and, and that is, you know, the debt to society. We term that that an inmate, a former offender, pays that debt. The reality is the system doesn't allow that debt to ever be paid. A criminal conviction, a felony conviction, is a life sentence. It's for life. It goes on forever. You can be an 18, 19-year-old young man with a first-time, nonviolent, low-level drug offense, get a conviction a year and a day in prison. That year and a day is going to have an impact on you until the day you die if you live to be 120 years old. At what point is enough enough? We have to have some resolution to the debt. Um, and as the criminal justice system stands today, that debt is never paid. Um, as for the barriers, the National Association of uh, Criminal Defense Lawyers, within I think the next week or two, is going to put out a report, um, a study that has been done over the last three years. And that study looked at all 50 states, uh, state collateral damage and federal collateral damage, 45,000 different elements of collateral damage to former offenders. That's absurd. Um, some of the things that Nicole mentioned, um, you know, think, think of some of the things for, for the people in the audience. You come out of prison, you are put on probation, you are told to get a job. If you don't get a job, you could get violated and put back in prison. So, you go out looking for a job. You can't get a license, so you can't get to a job. You can't get a checking account in many places. Um, you can't get insurance. And I will tell you from a personal perspective, my life insurance is in jeopardy. My homeowner's policy was in jeopardy. Mine, I paid my bills. I've never had a problem with my insurance. My conviction, has had a major impact on my own things. And you have to think 70% of the inmate population in many institutions around this country are drug related. They come out of prison, they're not coming back to a household, a home, a decent home, a job, a family. They're coming back to nothing to start from scratch. I came back to a home and to a family and it is extremely difficult for me. If it's difficult for me, those young men and women that are in prison on these low-level drug offenses, they're getting crucified. It is the demise of an entire generation of people. 
and read it, if I may. Please. You know, one of the other things that we often do to the formerly incarcerated is once they come out, we often burden them with debt. Something that a lot of people don't know, the Brennan Center did a, a recent report on fees and fines. Many people don't realize if you owe certain monies, say for instance, child support, and you are behind on that debt, once you are, are done with your incarceration period, you are expected in many instances, in most instances, to repay that debt. And oftentimes you cannot get out of the system until those fees and fines are paid. So it's really kind of an, an, an insane cycle that we expect people to work, to pay off the debt, but yet we make it harder for them to actually get full-time employment. Um, so that is a, a big issue. There's also a big issue in terms of what are we doing to prepare individuals to re enter their communities. Job trainings, educational opportunities that once 20, 30 years existed within our prison systems, those programs have been depleted in most instances. And where they do exist, they are minimal and not every inmate has access to them. So not only do we not provide opportunities when individuals return to the community, we also are not doing anything while they're incarcerated to prepare them to re-enter the job market and to become full-fledged, tax-paying citizens. Yeah. And Monica, I'm, I'm also struck in reading uh, your work how um, people struggle to kind of access the, the, public, the support systems that are out there, whether it's their family systems, the community systems, or kind of public assistance uh, programs. And so you know, what, what is your sense about how people you know, do that and, and navigate uh, you know, getting connected or staying disconnected? Um, well, as far as um, connecting themselves to the programs that the states provide to help them get on their feet again, most people are very reluctant to do that for a number of reasons. Um, with people who have been in the prison system, they actually don't want they don't want to be involved in the state at all if they can help it very often because partly because of the debt that um, that they can come out of prison with, if they get a legal job, their wages can be garnished as much as 50%. And so the return on their work is actually very, very low. Um, and there are a lot of different people for whom it's actually hard to get things like um, the program that was once welfare, temporary assistance for needy families. Um, people who've been convicted of drug crimes in a lot of states can't, actually can't access that program. For Even for families who just fall, um, fall on hard times, who maybe are already low income or fall out of the middle class, um, there are a lot of barriers just to finding out about the programs that are out there to help them. There aren't many states that do a very good job of just having one office where you can go and someone says, these are all the programs available to help you. Um, and when they do find those programs, um, one of the things I've heard anecdotally in almost every state that I've reported is that the, the caseworkers that they see first are actually very sort of um, discouraging of the idea of accessing welfare or food stamps. And so they, there's that extra burden. They already don't want to be there. They're already embarrassed that they have to be there. And then they have to deal with a caseworker who sort of also doesn't want them to get on the program or seems to not want to get them on the program. And so those kinds of things are difficult to find out about, and they're difficult to educate yourself about. And it's difficult to find out what your rights are. And so even in states where people actually do have the right to vote again when they leave prison, or they do have, or it should be easy to access these programs, they believe that they're difficult. And so they don't, they don't seek out help as much as they could. There's actually a technological dimension to this as well. And, and I think uh, maybe there always is here at, at New America. But uh, technology and data can be, can be enabling. It can also be uh, discounting. And, and especially when past setbacks are kind of available as part of the public record and placed in, in permanent view, uh, it can be very challenging. Click of the button, you get someone's record, you get their credit uh, history, and it can create additional obstacles. And so well, I think we wanted to have kind of a broader discussion about if there are ways of balancing some of the informational transparency objectives with the privacy objectives. And so we were talking previously about the, you know, the process of expungement and how, how important that is and, and the challenge that is. So Nicole, Bernie, do you have kind of feedback on, on that, uh, that process, that problem? Sure. Um, I will give you one salient example. There is a bill right now in Congress called the Democracy Restoration Act. This bill was introduced by Senator Cardin in the Senate and Mr. Conyers in the House. This bill would restore the right to vote with respect to federal elections immediately uh, once you are, have completed your incarceration, even if you remain on probation, parole, even if you owe fees and fines. The problem with that, uh, with, with this bill, or not with the bill, but with this concept is this. Many individuals, once they are done with their incarceration period, they don't even realize that perhaps their right to vote 
uh, has been restored. They don't necessarily know what the laws and the rules and regulations are in the particular jurisdiction to which they are returning are. So one of the components of that bill is information sharing and providing information and making certain that uh, an individual is given all of the necessary information they need about their voting rights in the particular jurisdiction to which they are returning. And we talk about how do we share that information? How do we ensure that not only the inmates are getting that information, but that the individuals in charge have that information? We did a study at the Brennan Center um, that was called de facto disfranchisement that talked about the fact that when you poll, and we did this as part of our study, we polled secretaries of state's offices around the country to ask them, what are the requirements for a formerly incarcerated person having their right to vote restored in your jurisdiction? We got myriad responses, many of which were wrong. So that tells you right there, if you are not getting the correct information, even from the entities within your jurisdiction that are supposed to have that information, that is a problem. That is keeping you from accessing the information that you need. So we talk a great deal about what do we need to do to improve the technology and the information sharing so that the, the formerly incarcerated get the correct information and we ensure that the people who are in charge of disseminating that information and overseeing voting um, are, are getting the, the correct information and know what they are supposed to be communicating to individuals. Did you have a uh, comment on the process of expungement and kind of navigating the information that's out there in the public record? The, um, it, it, the one thing I've realized about the system as a whole, um, from where I've seen it at this point, is that when you lack money, you basically lose your constitutional rights. And when you talk about expungement, you talk about clemency, you talk about um, things like that, for you to accomplish that, it takes an attorney. It, the laws are so technical um, so complex, it's not easy for these people to do it on their own. So they have to hire somebody to do it. If they can't hire them to do it, it's not getting done. And, and the reason I talked about the constitutional rights aspect, I was with men in prison that were there. I believe they were innocent. They pled guilty um, because they were forced to in many circumstances. They didn't have the money for counsel, for an attorney. Um, many people could have been given less sentence or filed appeals. They didn't have the money to file for those appeals. You, it's, the system, it, it contradicts its own mission statement. And without money, your constitutional rights are not what we believe them to be. And get, you know, in today's day and age, I just want to comment on the, on the internet issue. Even with expungements, even with clemency, uh, a pardon, a presidential pardon, all of that stuff is not going to eliminate what's on Google, and employers are going to go to Google, they're going to find your conviction, and that stuff is going to hamper you in future employment. And sometimes it's, it's wrong information and, and, and inaccurate. And, well, it's, and it's the, the information 99% of the time is media driven. It's driven by media sources, and media sources are not necessarily yeah. accurate. So that's a problem. Right. And, and I guess the, the issue is, is, is whose responsibility is it to kind of you know, respond to that, you know, whether it's policing it or creating some resources and support for a, a broader expungement process. Um, I think is a, is a, is a question for, uh, for the future. Um, I, I've been struck in, in a lot of this work by the growing um, bipartisan energy around the issue of um, sentencing reform and criminal justice reform. And I, and I guess I wanted some, some, some feedback and perspective on, on that. What, you know, what do we think you know, driving that? Is this kind of creating a new, um, is, there, is there a common ground you know, coalition that could emerge? And uh, where will it focus first? Will it focus on some of the sentencing issues? And how could it uh, be used to focus on some of the longer term reentry uh, issues uh, down the line? So Nicole, what have, what, what's your experience been trying to talk around this issue uh, across the aisle? As of, I would say, the last several years, it's actually been quite positive. Um, and I think at the heart of this collaboration is economics. Um, we all know that states have been suffering uh, over the last several years. Um, state economies are in trouble. Uh, and 
one of the things that we know about the criminal justice system in this country is that it costs a great deal of money. We spend an exorbitant amount of money to incarcerate people. We spend an exorbitant amount of money on prisons. And states are getting to the point where they're saying, you know what? We are not necessarily using our resources in the right way. We are using these resources to lock up so many people. And we all know that we have this huge problem of mass incarceration in this country. We incarcerate more people in this country than any other free democracy in the world. Um, and states are saying, we've got to do something about this. That is the foundation foundation of these collaborative efforts. So as a result of that, people on the right and left are coming together to say, we've got to do something to ensure that we are using our resources in a very thoughtful and efficient and effective way so that we are still maintaining safety in our communities, but that we are retooling our resources so that we are providing other opportunities, like making our schools better, making our communities safer. So as a result, we have a great deal of cooperation that's going on, specifically on the Hill. Um, two examples I can give to you. Um, with respect to the, to the felon disfranchisement issue and, and restoring the right to vote, we have a coalition of faith-based partners, law enforcement partners, civil rights partners, who are all working together to try to push forward on this right to restore, uh, on, this, on this effort to restore the right to vote. Uh, and you, you see it even from some unlikely suspects. Rand Paul, Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky, has recently in the last few months come out and said, you know, we've got to do something about this issue of making it difficult for the formerly incarcerated to vote. So we see it there. Right now on Capitol Hill, there is a bill called the Smarter Sentencing Act uh, that is being pushed in the Senate. We have folks from the law enforcement community working side by side with the progressive community trying to make headway with this bill. Again, because there's a recognition that not only are we spending a great deal of money, but we are also putting people in jail for far too long. Um, the president signed into law back in 2010 something called the Fair Sentencing Act. And that is the bill that lessened the disparity between crack and powder cocaine sentencing. And the Smarter Sentencing Act is going to do this. It is going to say for individuals who would have already served their time under the Fair Sentencing Act, um, we want to find ways to get them back into their communities because they've already paid that debt. And so we're finding a meeting of the minds in terms of figuring out how can we stop locking people up for too long and get them back out into our communities and get them to be full-fledged members and people who are actively involved, because those are the things that are going to keep our communities safer too. If we simply put people back out into the communities but we don't provide them with opportunities, we shouldn't be surprised at, at what we find uh, at the end of that process. We've got to provide these opportunities, and folks on both sides of the aisle are starting to see this. Yeah. The, the, one, the one thing that concerns me, uh, when I ran Rikers Island, my budget, my annual budget was about $900 million. If I had budget issues, I had to come up with alternatives to incarceration, I had to come up with incentivized good time, I had to reduce the bed space in the facilities, close down facilities if possible. These are all the things that you look at. The one thing that concerns me, and this goes back to what Nicole just said, a lot of times in these state budgets, the first thing to go are programs. Mm. You cannot, keep in mind, when you run a prison or a jail system, your first and foremost concern is security. You can't reduce security posts. You, there's a mandatory minimum staffing that you have to have. You can't touch security. <coughs> So the first thing that goes is programs. Well, you take programs, it's education, it's life improvement skills, it's all the things that these people need when they go back into society. You cannot lock people up for eight years, 10 years, 15 years, give them absolutely nothing, and then send them back into society and believe that that's a benefit to society, that they're gonna be better people. They've learned nothing. They've gone back into society with nothing. So what you've done is you've created an element where they're going to have to revert back to crime to live, or um, they're just going to fade away and, and run into all kinds of psychological problems, as Monica talked about. Now, what's the reception you're getting when you're talking to more conservative audiences? I, I, th I think it's, it's uh, as Nicole said, it's... You know, it's, uh, it's coming around. Uh, you know, on the state level, states have to look at this because it's unsustainable. You can't, 
we are mass incarcerating individuals. It's, uh, you know, it's, it, it almost in my mind these days, it doesn't even seem like justice anymore. Um, and it's unsustainable in the states. My, my bigger concern right now is the federal system. The federal system, it, as far as I have seen, there has not been a budget reduction in the BOP for 25 years, and their, their incarceration rates have, I, don't, I can't even tell you the amount that it's, it's it was 25,000 inmates in 1980. Today it's 218,000. It hasn't been reduced one year. Um, that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, we are going to open up uh, the floor for uh, some, some questions here and, and involve you as well. Uh, but before we do that, I wanted to ask kind of each of you for some, some big, big picture ideas uh, of reform that, that you'd want you know, to, put, to put on the, the agenda, both to, to reform the criminal justice system, but also to promote more effective uh, reentry. You've touched on some of them. What do you want to emphasize um, uh, for the audience here? Um, well, I, um, one of the things that I've sort of been thinking since I wrote my story was that um, the prison system is sort of the most robust uh, social program we have in this country right now. It's the best funded and it's the best um, maintained and there's a lot of general support for it. And so what I think we're seeing is that all of the problems that people have are flowing into the prison system. Right. And so we have um, a prison population where 15% of them have some sort of serious mental illness. Um, there's a lot of problems of poverty that get um, can lead to people sort of being involved in the criminal justice system. And then the poverty that they experience when they get back out of prison sort of helps them flow back into the prison system. And so I think one of the things that we have to think about is that we as a society have to deal with the problems that people have because they're going to flow somewhere and they're going to pop up somewhere. And um, the prison system is not the, it's not a good system for dealing with most of the problems that people have. Cool. Sure. You know, there are two things that, that I'd like to point out. One, and, and this is an easy thing, uh, and they've recently been successful with this, I believe, in Baltimore, but banning the box. Mm -hmm. When individuals go to apply for jobs, I mean, it is not necessary to ask, do you have a criminal conviction in your background? Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a former employment lawyer uh, before I came to the Brennan Center, and I will tell you the thing that employers will say they are most interested in is, do you have the talent, do you have the skills and the capabilities that I need? If you have made a mistake and you have indeed paid that debt to society and yet you are qualified for the position, that's what employers should be focusing on. So this effort around the country to ban the box from employment applications, I think, is a step in the right direction. The second thing is trying to deal with funding and how we are spending money. Um, we recently at the Brennan Center put out a report uh, on f offering 15 executive actions, things that we thought the president could do immediately using the power of the pen to make immediate change. In fact, the president said during his State of the Union address this past January that he was going to start trying to use the power of the pen more effectively. Right. So we wanted to jump on that. One of the things that we suggest is that the president require that with respect to all federal grants that go out to uh, law enforcement agencies, that they tie those grants to what we are calling success-oriented funding such that if you tie the monies to a specific set of outcomes, positive outcomes, that then you will see better results. If we are simply providing grants to law enforcement agencies and letting them spend it as they will, well, you're not necessarily getting the results you want. However, if we tie those grant monies and say that these are the performance measures, and within these performance measures, we need to see concrete steps that you are taking to, for instance, reduce mass incarceration, you're going to get a better outcome. So I think those are two key steps that can be taken, banning the box and the, pa the president using the power of the pen to say that with respect to federal funding, we are going to put performance measures in place to try to ensure that the ways in which jurisdictions are spending the grant money we give them will give us better outcomes to help reduce racial disparities, to help reduce mass incarceration. I think mandatory minimums and sentencing guidelines are draconian. Uh, I think, in, especially in the federal system, there has to be alternatives to incarceration. I think that we have to have real programs uh, within the BOP that teach life improvement skills and um, teach respect and discipline and educate these inmates so when they get back out into society, 
they have at least a small chance to succeed, to get a job, to, to benefit their family. Um, those are probably some of the most important to me. Thank you. So uh, let's uh, see some hands who might want to uh, get in on this. We'll start in the way back there. Where are some others? OK. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Wondering, um, oh, um, do I need to start over? No, I was saying, yeah, I was saying, ahead. yeah, I write about felon voting and, and trying to get people to be, uh, you know, to, to really connect with these stories uh, when they don't really see, uh, you know, the folks that, that I'm writing about as sympathetic. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, um, you know, how to generate empathy, fr frankly, for folks, not just, you know, for people who may be found to be innocent you know, that get out of prison. I mean, I, I think a lot of people connect with those folks, but what about, you know, folks that actually have, like you said, pay their debt to society or trying to reestablish their lives? You know, how do you, how do you get them on board? And then also, um, you know, getting society to understand that this really does affect the entire society and not, and, and not just having a kind of us versus them uh, mentality. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on how to, how to get Generating people empathy. on board with that. Sure. Should I take that? Please, Read. and Monica, you too, and for, um, uh, all of you. You know, so much of what we do when we talk about this issue is we focus not only on the policy and advocacy, but also on the messaging. We spend a great deal of time with our communications people talking about how do we message on these issues, because it is important to try to figure out how do you connect with the larger community on these issues. And some of the things that we've come across are this. Number one, the individuals who have actually been successful in reintegrating themselves into the community, we've got to start using them as spokespeople. People have to be able to see tangible evidence of success stories. They can't just assume, uh, you know, anecdotally that you know people are getting out of prison and 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 they're becoming active, uh, engaging members of of, of of society. We've got to have those people on the forefront and serve as spokespeople. The other thing we have to do is continue to build bridges across the aisle. And when I say the aisle, I don't simply mean the political spectrum. I mean in terms of the faith community, in terms of the law enforcement community, pull together these unlikely allies and have them engage on these issues. I think that's going to be a great way to try and get more individuals engaged on these issues and thinking about these issues and becoming sympathetic to these issues. Finally, the other thing that we try to do is we try to get people to look inward in terms of their own families and their own organizations, their own churches. Everybody within our country has someone somewhere that they engage with who has had some sort of uh, uh, it, 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 some kind of uh, involvement with the criminal justice system. Uh, if, if everyone starts to look at the people that they connect to, the people whom they trust, whom they value, and start to see that, yes, I know individuals who've had these experiences, and yet I see that they are active members of their community and they are contributing in a positive way, I think that's also going to go a long way towards helping to change attitudes and mindsets. Um, I think about this a lot because it's sort of what I try to do in my work, and I, um, you know, I, I choose to do really very long articles about one person, um, partly for this reason, just to humanize them. Um, and what I try to think about doing is really showing sort of every single part of their life, including the things that aren't so maybe aren't don't don't seem perfect, because I think. I think one of the tendencies that a lot of people have is sort of just to expect perfection from people who, especially those who have had, um, especially those who are poor. And it's like, well, you can't, you've got to just live this super austere life and you've got to work really hard and never have any fun. I think that's what society expects of them and it's just sort of not the way humans live. And so I try to just show, I just try to show people being really human. And so when I picked Travis to profile, part of the reason I did that is because he was actually really funny and really smart. And I thought people would, connect with that. I don't know if it worked, but you know, he was he had done bad things in his past. He was pretty open about it. Most of the worst things that he had ever done were really public, but he um you know, he was all he, it wasn't all he was. And so I try to work on moving past the stereotypes, but you know, it, it's a it's a really big challenge because 
people aren't necessarily going to connect with people that they've never met in real life and whose lives they can't imagine. And so I think you have to make them imagine their lives. Can we, can we make empathy work, or does it have to be a bottom line? I, I think, I think the, the key is the message. The key is educating the American public uh, and also educating Congress, because I can tell you there are things in the system. I've, been, I've worked in this system for 30, 35 years. I've put people in prison. I put people in prison for a long time. But these were bad people that did bad things, tried to kill me, uh, tr killed friends of mine, partners. Uh, I seized tons of cocaine and millions in drug proceeds from them. But then I went to prison and I saw people with enormous sentences for first time nonviolent offenses. I met commercial fishermen that caught too many fish. I met young men that enhanced their income on a mortgage application, spending 18 months, two, three years in prison. And there's lots of them. If anybody told me before I went to prison, you're gonna go to prison and you're gonna meet some really decent, good people, coming from where I came from, I would have laughed in their face. And I can tell you, I met decent, good men. Good family men, they made a mistake. Good fathers, they made a mistake. And they are damaged forever. Um, and it's, uh, it's I, I think it's all about the messaging. It's all about educating the American public. These men, these people that come out of prison, they're not monsters, they're not animals. And the, and the problem is, and this goes back to what Nicole said, you know, we put these people in prison without programs, without the right life improvement skills, the, the right education, they are taught in prison without those things. They're taught how to steal, lie, cheat, manipulate, gamble, and con, and fight. Prison is a training ground for thuggery and criminality. Is that really what you want back in society? It's not. It shouldn't be. We should be doing everything in our power to get them on the right track when they get out. And I think if people could see them for what they are, for what they really are, if there was some educational, and there's, I, I've got to give this, I got to give this one plug because I, I went to an event last week. There is a young woman in New York by the name of Catherine Hoke who created this organization called Defy. And I went to one of her events last week where I watched a man who spent 21 years in prison He's been out for less than six months. He gave a business prep, uh, uh, a business presentation on a company that he's trying to promote, and she took him through this process. People have to look at programs like that where, where they help these men get back on their feet and get back into society. Uh, I, I can't say enough about that program and, and programs like that. Um, people have to look at those. And, and the one thing I, I came away from walking out of that event was if you, anybody in this audience, met that man in prison or before he went to prison, you would probably say he's an animal. He's a monster. He's a bad guy. But when I saw him standing up there giving this presentation, and looking at him really trying to do what he was doing, I came across with a different mindset. And I think the American public would too. If we've got to do something about educating the American public on what the system is, what it does, and how it impacts society. Thank you. Um, all right, we just have a few more minutes. So uh, let's um, ask in the back there question in the back. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Bonnie Newman Davis and I am a professor at North Carolina A&T State University. My question um, deals with how realistic it is to sort of overcome some of the things that we've been talking about today. Um, you know, the question of race uh, in the uh, prison system is overwhelming, first of all. Then there's the glamorization of uh, incarceration that we see so much in the media. Uh, economic engine, I think that someone may have alluded to it. Um, I was surprised to see <clears throat> uh, yesterday, I passed by the courthouse here, but somewhere in the area, and I saw nothing but dark people coming out. 
of uh, the courthouse, and that's the case in many, many cities throughout the country. Um, and so I also wanted to find out how are uh, some of the um, prisoners who are released, how are, they over, how are they able to overcome some of the obstacles? Uh, I personally know of someone who was released and um, seems to be back on his feet. Uh, fairly quickly, so How's a lot of happen? questions. Yeah, big questions. Let, um, let me let me yeah. let me just say one thing on the glamorization of prison. Okay, take it from me. You know, I've had people say to me, "You went to a minimum security camp. It's a country club, club fed." I've heard all that stuff. I have housed some of the worst inmates in the world at Rikers. I I I understand super max, max low, medium, minimum security. Let me say this, find the most prestigious hotel in Washington, D.C. Go there, lock yourself in the bathroom for a year, and tell me how prestigious it is. Tell me what a country club it is. There is nothing like the deprivation of freedom, nothing. I don't give a damn what kind of institution you're in. I don't care if it's a minimum security camp or a supermax. The deprivation of freedom is profound. Living like an animal is profound. Eating out of a microwave, a Tupperware dish. Um, you live basically like an animal. Nobody in this room would come close to living anything like you would live in the most minimum security camp, which people call a country club. I don't think it's a country club. I don't think it's club fed. It's prison, and it turns people into monsters. All right. Unfortunately, that is going to be the, the last word. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for coming to join us. Thank you for being here. And um, thank you. We're done. Yeah.